Hello and welcome to Criminal Justice in a Nutshell. This, my name is John Fisher and this episode of Criminal Justice in a Nutshell is going to be on punishment and the history and evolution and the problems that we find within the correctional institutions and the history of prisons within the United States of America. The first prison in the United States of America was the Walnut Street Prison. It was in Pennsylvania and it was established by the Quakers. Um, William Penn and the Quakers established a life within Pennsylvania and realized that in the civil world punishment needed to come across. The first major prison, the Walnut Street Prison, um, the Eastern, Pencil Eastern State Penitentiary, the Pennsylvania system, did not believe in corporal punishment. You know, throughout the ages and throughout history, we would punish people by banishing them, by putting them in exile, by hanging them, by burning them at the stake. Although, and for the record right now, not a single individual in the United States of America, even before it was the United States of America, has ever been burned at the stake within the United States. Uh, within the Americas, there's only been one person burned at the stake, and it was a witch that was burned at the stake in Ojinaga, Mexico. Uh, but anyway, the Quakers didn't believe in corporal punishment. They didn't believe in cutting off your hands or whipping you, or flogging you, or cutting out your tongue. They didn't believe in branding or any of those things. They wanted you to reflect upon your soul. A spiritual reflection they believed would bring about change. They put you in the Walnut Street Prison, the Eastern State Penitentiary, and they would demand automatic, complete, and total silence. You weren't allowed to speak. You weren't allowed to talk. You weren't allowed, allowed to do anything. You were in your cell with one window, one skylight coming in, with a beam of light, that, and that light would end up on a table. And on that table was a Bible, and you were expected to read it. You were to reflect upon your crimes to society and the punishment that you had with society. Uh, no one was allowed to speak. You were not allowed to talk. You weren't allowed to do anything. If you were taken out of your cell to brought somewhere, a hood was put over your head so that nobody else would know that you were in the prison. None of the other inmates would know that you were there. Uh, eventually, they found that being locked in a cell 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 364 days a year, uh, was making people go crazy and go nuts. So they evolved a little bit and let people do work projects and they were able to leave their cell, but they were still not allowed to talk. Okay. This evolved into the Auburn system or it came out of the state of New York and it was a tier system or a congregate system. Uh, you were still remained in silent con uh, confinement and they thought that the fear of punishment would cause people to uh, reevaluate their lives and would help them change the way that they did the things that they did. Uh, the prisons developed during the period of the Enlightenment. It was the interest of humanitarian groups and the thought of a humanitarian ideal. Sending somebody to prison uh, in the 17, 1800s was humanitarian. It was the idea that we could reform you. It's called a penitentiary because you would go to the prison or you go to the penitentiary to serve penance and you would spend this time in communion with God and you would walk and you would, when you were released from prison, you were a good God-fearing, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christian who would never commit another crime. Well, running a prison costs money, and it costs a lot of money. Uh, and they found, and slavery was now illegal. Uh, the, 15th, the 13th Amendment um, ended slavery. Uh, the 14th Amendment guaranteed due process to the, slave, uh, to the former slaves. And the 15th Amendment guaranteed voting rights. But now we no longer had a slave population. So in 1865, uh, the states looking for ways to make cheap money or easy money, 
they would contract out their inmates to these plantation owners. You know, at first, you know, they had slaves prior to the Civil War. After the Civil War, the slaves were gone, or most of the slaves were gone. So they would contract with uh, the prison and let these inmates go work. Uh, the inmates would receive no money for this, but the state would receive money for it. And it was called the contract system. Uh, also, there was the convict lease system. Uh, say, for example, I own uh, 10,000 acres out here in Howard County. And I'm running 15,000 head of cattle, uh, which is a little too much for Howard County. But I'm running 15,000 head of cattle. It's just me, my two sons, my two daughters, uh, and my wife, you know, I can't run this ranch by myself. So I'd go out here to Colorado City, or I'd go up to La Mesa, and I'd say, I want to rent uh, 15 inmates for the next three weeks. And then I would pay, I'd have to house these inmates, I'd have to make sure that these inmates didn't escape, and then I'd pay the state of Texas. Um, and now they've also got a public account system as well. Um, current now, all of that has been ruled unconstitutional and it's illegal. Uh, the industry that is performed within the prison system is only intended to help increase or help the prison itself remain, supposedly, remain uh, stable and self-sufficient. They make brooms, they make leather products, they do all of these things, but they can only be sold to government entities. Okay, so if I wanted to order a new holster, I could, you know, order a new holster. Uh, it would all be in leather and it would be really nice and pretty and the inmates would have made it and then I'd pay the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for that holster or for a broom or whatever I wanted to do because I am a state employee. Uh, being a professor here at Howard College. Well, we in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we entered the prison reform era. And the National Congress of Penitentiary and Reformatory Discipline started making changes to all of these things because um, we needed to reform the punishment, the, cor the, the, the corporal punishments and the punishments that were going on. If you um, ever read or watched or listened to the, the story and, or read the autobiography of Carl Pan's Ram, uh, the journal of a murderer, uh, he's a, one of America's most prolific serial killers. And there is the assumption, there is the, the assertion made within the diary that the reason why Carl Panzram became a serial killer was because of the treatment that he received while he was in prison. And the prison reform efforts tried to change that. Uh, they set up an indeterminate sentencing program. They found that that was bad because, you know, it was also racist at the core. Institutional racism was found within the indeterminate sentencing. But it was turned into a medical model. And what the idea was, I'll send you to prison and you can go to prison from two years to 12 years. And if you complete all of these programs and you become a excellent candidate for uh, release, we'll go ahead and let and release you after two years. But if you're not and you're not cooperating and you're not working the program and you're not going to the education, you're not doing the drug counseling and you're not going through all the programs that are made possible for you, you could stay in prison for 12 years. And what we found and what happened in the middle of the 19th, 20th century was that whites were getting out of prison as soon as possible and African Americans were staying as long as the prison could keep you in the system. It was a form of institutional racism that needed to be addressed. And I think it has been addressed because they've done away with the indeterminate sentencing now, and they have uh, mandatory sentencing, they have determinate sentencing uh, with the possibility of good time. Uh, they've done away with the stripes in prisons. You still find the inmates wearing stripes at the county jail, but the prison, 
they're primarily wearing a solid color. Uh, there's no more code of silence. Uh, there's no more chain gang uh, where you're in a lockstep shuffle with nine other people. If one person falls, they all fall. Uh, you're allowed to have media. You know, there was a point in time where media was not allowed in a prison at all. The only thing that you had, the ability that you had to read was the Bible itself. You weren't allowed movies or the radio. Uh, there were no visitations, and there are now. You're allowed to get mail. Although your mail is red when you get to prison, uh, there's, there's mail now allowed. And then you have specialized prisons that focus on specific things. Texas has the Substance Abuse Felony Punishment Facility. Um, in order to go there, you have to have a substance abuse problem and you can serve time there. Uh, there's private prisons. There's prisons that deal with strictly mental health issues. There's prisons that are specifically designed for sex offenders. Because if you put a sex offender in a general population, he's probably going to end up dead. Um, and then you have the prison industries to help make sure that the prison remains self-sufficient in what they're doing. Okay, the um, development of parole was established. It started by McConaughey in Australia and Crofton created the ticket of leave. Um, and what these issues did was they set up an early release program. If you got the points and you earned enough points, you were allowed to go free, um, but you were still under supervision. We found within the contemporary correctional situation since the 1960s, uh, three major trends, and that was the prisoner rights movement. And I think the first major case was Ruiz versus Texas. And this was a way to find reform within the Texas prison system. It also saw that the prison system were overcrowded. There's 159,000 beds within the Texas prison system today, and every one of them is full, and there's a waiting list. We've got guys and girls in the county jails waiting for an opportunity to be sent to the state prison. Uh, violence in the nation's prisons is still a horrible issue. And it's the violence is not only between the officers and the inmates, but inmate on inmate and inmate rape. The most recent issue to try to combat inmate violence or prison violence is PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And this has made a zero or developed a zero tolerance for sexual activity within the prison system. Uh, whether you are a correctional officer or staff member having sex with an inmate or an inmate having sex with another inmate, it is a federal offense to have sex with an inmate. Uh, and these are issues that are coming about contemporarily. Um, I think we're going to end this lecture here. Uh, with a little bit about the history and development in the nutshell of corrections. Uh, this has been John Fisher, Corrections in a Nutshell, Punishment. I hope that you have an absolutely great day.